Welcome to Behavioral Groups, the podcast that brings behavioral science to light. I'm Kurt Nelson, and unfortunately for this episode, there is no Tim Houlihan. Tim has been knocked out this past week with shingles and was not able to be part of today's podcast. However, he did want me to inform everyone to go out and get their shingles vaccine if they are eligible. Really, go out and get it today. I would not uh, wish what Tim is going through on anybody out there. It is a horrible, horrible disease. So go out and get your shingles vaccine today, which goes to show that life is uncertain. I mean, we can surmise that from the fact that I am doing this episode solo. It is unplanned. This was not what we had thought about. This was not the certain way that we do behavioral groups. And usually we equate, or at least I equate, or have the tendency to equate, uncertainty with fear, dread, worry, and a whole lot of negative feelings and emotions. However, our guests today talk about the fact that uncertainty doesn't need to be this way. In fact, there is an upside to uncertainty if we take a different perspective and a different approach to it. Nathan and Susanna Furr are authors of The Upside of Uncertainty, a guide to finding possibility in the unknown. And the conversation that we had about the book, but it also went into their research and it presents a new way for us to think about and to respond to uncertainty in our lives. That if we can utilize uncertainty We can actually use it to drive motivation and build excitement and to get us to move, to start doing things. And there is this idea that uncertainty can become part of our toolkit to live a more open and fulfilling life, to open up the possibilities, as Susanna talked about. And Nathan and Susanna showcase this in the discussion, talking about how we can reframe uncertainty and the many tools that they develop for embracing it and using it as a positive driver for people's lives. So with that, I invite you to sit back with a brand new brew that you are curious about but are uncertain with what it's going to do, and join me today for my conversation with Nathan and Susanna Fur. Nathan and Susanna Fur, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you for having us. Mm-hmm. Third time is the charm, so uh, all listeners... We have uh, we did an interview with these guys, uh, I don't know, six, seven, eight months ago and had audio difficulties and then had technical difficulties with the, the refam. And now this time, just so people know, you're only hearing Kurt's voice and normally you hear Tim's voice at the beginning. But Tim is feeling uh, under the weather and is in the emergency room right now. So we are doing this regardless and moving forward. And as always, we start with a speed round. So, Nathan, I'll give you this first speed round question to answer. All right. Would you rather have dinner with a great athlete or a great musician? Great musician, hands down. Hands down. Yeah. Oh, man, Tim would be really upset that he's not here because this is what he loves to hear. So who do you have a do you have a a musician in mind for that dinner or? Oh, my gosh. Well, I I probably should, you know, pick somebody who's living. But, uh, you know, (laughs) we we, we can transcend time and uh, all kind of sorts of living or dead kind of things. You know, I really I really like the gentleman who recomposed Vivaldi, Max Richter, uh, because Vivaldi is such an old, beautiful, but overplayed composition. And what he did is he took that and he said, like, how could I? take the pieces of that that are interesting, that are inspiring. Like he describes the you know, few, first few opening bars like as this really inspiring part, but then could I make it like a dance loop and loop it? And I just think somebody who can see something that you know we all take for granted and reimagine it in a new way, in a way that like reaches you and inspires you, I, I want to talk to that kind of person. <laughs> oh, man. Once again, I'm really upset that Tim isn't here because he would he would be grooving on that, as he would like to say. All right. All right. Susanna, white wine, red wine, no wine. Red wine. Red wine. OK. Yep. Well, you guys are in France right now, right? Yeah, that's where we yeah. live. So we yeah. actually discovered wine in, in France. We weren't drinkers before we moved here. So we're still newbies, but we now we went quickly. Everyone said, oh, start with white. But we loved reds. So <laughs> it's got so much complexity, right? Yeah. So much. I mean, really here in France, the thing you learn to appreciate is how seriously 
They appreciate every detail of like the slant to the slope and exactly what Where kind of stones. Where it came from, though. Yeah. And the, so the reds are, you know, it's not about the grape. They'll say that second, but first it's the region. So you're yes. kind of brought to a place immediately when they're telling you about you know, what you can choose from. And my experience, which is limited again, is that wines in France and like Italy have such different, uh, it is just so much better than anything that we can get typically in the States. And I'm sure everybody from California is going to be yelling at me here. <laughs> um, but, you know, this this idea that there is just something about that history that they have and the hundreds and hundreds of years that these vines and these, you know, have have been around that adds, as you said, there's there's that entire complexity around all of it that that comes with this. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, this is a toss up. So you guys and, and maybe maybe this is something, you know, you you will see if you have the same same answer on this. Uh, on vacation, do you go with a fixed itinerary or no itinerary at all? Well, we're different. <laughs> so I I like the fixed itinerary because as you know, we wrote this book about the upside of uncertainty. I am not naturally great with uncertainty. I'm not gifted. So I want to know like where I'm going to sleep that night and where I'm going to eat and that I'm going to have a seat at the table and, and all those things. Whereas I think, you know, Susanna, yeah. I'll let you speak for yourself. I definitely am not super daring where I would just pick somewhere and go without a reservation to sleep. Like I like knowing a few constellation points, but I do love just kind of being able to wander and find something and explore that way. Yeah, it makes so we end up mingling yeah. our two zones. It makes me think of our friend who we really admire, who taught us about getting lost. He purposely yeah. tries to get lost because he says you discover some of the most interesting things that way. I have I have a, a friend acquaintance that goes to the most remote parts of the world and has no itinerary at all. Doesn't have so to to your point doesn't have anywhere to speak. He was in the Andes in Chile and got lost and ended up meeting an older gentleman on the road who didn't he, they couldn't really communicate. But it was cold and it was late, and the gentleman invited him in for dinner and. And spent the night and he said it's one of the most memorable, you know, just they're, they're drinking some concoction that he has no idea what it is. It's not wine and it's not yeah. like it's anyway, it's it's fascinating when you you do that. And you guys, your, your book is The Upside of Uncertainty. And so I'm going to ask this last question. True or false? Has uncertainty gotten a bad rap? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> True. True. But at the same time. Uncertainty is hard and yeah. it has a downside and it, we are wired to fear it and it's challenging. And so in that sense, it, it's false because uncertainty brings all those things. But on the other hand, it's it's true that it's gotten a bad rap because really our fundamental belief is that you cannot get to possibility without some uncertainty. And so it's gotten a bad rap because it's not getting credit for the possibility side of that equation. I love that, that you can't get to possibility without, you know, that element of uncertainty. So, all right, let's uh, going back, uh, you know, we've talked about this than the, than the first time we interviewed you, but I'm going to ask you again, what was the impetus for deciding to write this book? What was the kind of trigger that made this all happen? Well, in many ways, it, it ties into what we were talking about, which is it's been 20 years in the making, a book 20 years okay. in the making, because I I study innovation. How does it happen? And I've gotten to interview innovators. And one thing I noticed about them is that while we celebrate their achievement, while we love to talk about their startup or their breakthrough or their insight or whatever it may be, we almost never tell the other part of the story, which is to achieve that thing, they had to step into the unknown. They had to take a risk. And I, because I struggle with that, I was just so curious because I wanted that possibility, but I'm afraid of that uncertainty piece. I, you know, like your friend wandering the roads, having that amazing experience, you have to be willing to endure the fact that you don't know what you're going, where you're going and what's going to happen to have that life-changing experience. So how do I, how do I, how could I get better at that? And so I just kept asking them questions. So what do you do? Do you have a practice? How have you learned to do this? What have you learned in the process? And that was the genesis of the book. And then I'll just add, uh, 
So it was a topic that I was always just so excited to hear. So I wasn't in those initial interviews and Nathan and I just loved that conversation as a couple. You know, we are married. We have four kids. Uh, while he was doing his PhD, I, I started a clothing line. So we all, we always had kind of maybe what people thought were kind of bold lives, doing courageous things, going back to a PhD when you have four kids is kind of <laughs> bonkers, some people would think. But ultimately, I intuitively felt like uncertainty did. I, I understood how it was that portal to possibility. And so I decided to, you know, team up with Nathan to write the book in a little bit of a more human setting in a human frame, because what the pandemic gave us, even though it was already being written, was this shift of, oh, my gosh, we really need to talk to the human inside these managers that might be reading this. And ultimately, it made it a book that probably anyone could read and enjoy because uncertainty hits us as the creatures that we are first, because it does all of those things that it makes us anxious. It makes us afraid. And so when we embrace it as, oh, this is a normal part, there's nothing wrong with me, then we're able to stay around and hang on and not go to those maladaptive places that we would do. And a lot of your book is about the the ways that people can do that, right? They can tap into the the possibility that comes with uncertainty and and how to as you said, don't go down the dark paths to that maladaptive. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, in particular, you talk about the first aid cross, right? It's an important visual within this book. Can you kind of talk a little bit about what that is and, and what are some of the ways that as you are kind of coaching people and kind of communicating to them about what you've learned, how do they overcome that angst that, uns the, the, that comes with uncertainty? I'd love to. Yeah. I actually, I just want to, as a preface, just acknowledge there are actually two fundamental kinds of uncertainty we talk about in the book. There's what we call planned uncertainty, which is when you choose it. Like, let's say you're going to go start a new venture, a new project, a new, just anything new. You chose to go on that trip. But then there's unplanned uncertainty. Like, I mean, it's happening with Tim right now, right? And yeah. and that's one of the hardest ones to see the possibility in. And uh, you know, we you know, we can talk more about that. But the first aid cross for uncertainty is really a set of tools to address all those things. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we did uh, put these tools around a first aid cross, we knew it was this international symbol of of aid and of help. And because there's 42, we actually ended up compiling 42 <laughs> tools. And so we said, OK, we've got to make like a framework for people. And so those 42 are situated around the four arms of the of the cross. And we have four categories. So if you imagine looking at a red cross, the north arm is reframing tools. So to reframe is really this moment when you learn and practice that uncertainty is one side of this uncertainty possibility coin and that it's normal and natural and really the only way to get to these great possibilities. Mm -hmm. If the left arm would be the prime category and priming is that activity that's kind of interesting. We don't always think about it this way, but there are some things that require a priming action before you actually do the thing. So priming an engine or priming a wall when you're going to paint. And so prime tools are this selection of tools that help you get ready to go into the uncertainty that's facing you. Do tools on the right side. Doing, you know, is one of the best ways to resolve uncertainty, taking action, having a vote, getting going. But there are better ways to do it than others. And so that category has a lot of fun ideas for how to do that with, with courage and also with better outcomes. And then the bottom arm of tools is sustain. And so sustaining tools are Really, we use the the Paris coat of arms. There's a beautiful mm. little symbol all over the city of Paris, and it's a boat on tossed water. And the Latin that is goes with it is tossed, not sinking. And we mm. love that because you will feel tossed. Uncertainty will put you in scenarios and and create feelings and 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 situations in your body that actually feel like abort mission, stop, turn around. And how do you sustain yourself through that? You know, when when something goes differently than you planned and hoped, because it does, uncertainty rarely follows a little pattern that we would like it to. So I think it's it's a really easy to grasp, um, obviously, heuristic that people can can kind of grab onto. And I want to dig into some of these in in some more depth. In particular, uh, I think it's really interesting how you guys talk about reframing. 
and some of the tools that you have within there. Because again, at least in my work as a, you know, a, a psychologist, you, you know, that the way that we frame any situation has a huge impact on how we respond in that situation. And it is one of those things, though, that is often just an innate reaction, right? It, it even, uh, particularly from our, our, our own mindset based on our history and a variety of other factors that come into play. And so to consciously reframe, how are you guys uh, using this within uh, this idea of, of kind of overcoming the, the issues with uncertainty? And how do people reframe their situations to be more positive about this? I love that you mentioned your work in psychology because the, the fundamental activity, which again, the tools are to help you do that, but that category of activities is rooted in uh, psychology and behavioral economics, but it actually surprisingly has some really relevant extensions, like in my field of strategy and innovation. So it's much bigger than, than just that. But it, but it is at, this, at the core, it's a very well-demonstrated phenomenon that the way we describe something to ourselves and others shapes how we think, decide, and act. So, so like the Nobel Prize winning study that we always talk about is the Kahneman Tversky. You give people, you know, the situation, there's a disease and there's two treatments and treatment A is 95% chance of success. Treatment B is 5% chance of failure. Well, statistically, those are the same thing. Nonetheless, even though we know it's the same thing, we all choose 95% chance of success because we're wired by evolution to be gain seeking. We want to win and loss averse. We want, we, we run away from things that feel like we're going to lose. Now, this is so important for uncertainty because why? Uncertainty almost inevitably registers first as a loss. And so we'll run away from it. But if uncertainty and possibility are potentially two sides of the same coin, well, then what would that like? If we could frame it in terms of the possibility, then maybe we would feel less anxious. We'd actually feel like this could be a game. Uh, and, and this happens at an individual level. It happens at an organizational level. You know, we can give examples of that, of course. I mean, some of my favorites uh, are, you know, when we look at, there's an empirical study done of Barnes and Noble and and Borders, the big brick and mortar booksellers that used to be in the U.S., when Amazon comes with a kind of fundamental threat to their existence, and and as you know, of course, Barnes and Noble survives and Borders fails, and and when this team looked at all the factors that could go into explaining that, they argued that the biggest reason was that Barnes and Noble framed that great uncertainty of what does this internet and this new really powerful competitor mean for us. They framed it in terms of the opportunity it presented to serve customers in new ways, not the threat, the uncertainty, the loss. And so I see it all over the place. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, so that's a good you know, overview of how framing works. But one of the things I love about our book is that we put tools in that reframe section to help people get out of even just you know, the normal sets of options they may have, because we're actually hoping that they will start reframing what's possible for them on a bolder and, and braver scale. So we have tools in there like adjacent possible. And that's a word that's taken from biology to describe a reality that's hovering, you know, on the current reality, but something that you don't, dis you don't find until you take that first step towards it. And I think Stephen Johnson is the one who writes about, it's like if you imagine a castle, and there might be a room 10 doors down that's going to be this glorious thing that we don't know yet. And this is important right now for our world. We have a lot of solutions that we are in need of for these existential, you know, climate change and all these things. <laughs> but we have to open those doors to get there. But how do you how do you do it? So, you know, the adjacent possible can be um, an example we give in our book is this innovator, Barbara A. Link, who was with her mom. And her mom said, over my dead body, will I ever use a walker or a wheelchair? And she thought, oh. That's so sad. And it just kind of gave her mind a little question. And she set out to think, well, wait, what's the situation? What if my mom needs one of those? Turns out 60% of people in wheelchairs still have the use of their legs. It's just there's not an option. And so she created this kind of tricycle where people sit up higher. Um, people who have this now 
are so thrilled because they're at a level with, you know, their people that they're with. They feel less disrespected and less kind of out of the situation, but also they're able to move around in ways that they they couldn't and they're keeping the use of their legs. So it's a, it's not the craziest thing that no one could ever envision, but it wasn't a reality. It was hovering. And so reframing can be that where you 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 believe that maybe I'm supposed to figure something else out here that I'm not seeing. And so our reframe tools really encourage deep reflection, curiosity, creativity, instead of just looking for kind of really quick, you know, plug in, plug out options, but really seeing, getting excited about all the possibilities and potential that is that is here for us. Yeah, I, I just got to jump in on that because I, I <laughs> one of the things I, I love about the adjacent possible, I'm so glad you brought that up, is we have, it's just such a great illustration of the idea of what we're talking about. Because you and I, most of us, we look out at the biological world around us and we say, oh my gosh, that's pretty fixed. Like, you know, I don't see that things have changed that much. But what these these are evolutionary biologists who are talking about is they actually look out the world and they see an infinite number of possibilities that could happen. That's the adjacent possible. And, and Stuart Kaufman, who was one of the ones who really coined this, he, he just like gave the example of a screwdriver. Like from a narrow point of view, you could see that as like you use it to turn a screw. But it could be any number of things. It could be a, a doorstop. It could, you know, be a, a weapon. You could tie it on a spear and fish with it. You could rent that spear out to people and take a cut of their revenues and create a global empire of, you know, screwdriver spear fishers. I mean, I mean, the point, it's, it's silly examples, but he goes on to illustrate, if you really think about it, there's actually so many more possibilities than we tend to see in our daily life. Well, you, you do have a number of tools in there and, and a couple of that come to mind for me are that you have the possibility quotient, a quotient and then the, in the infinite game, right? I love both of those. They might not relate just to the reframing part, but could you talk a little bit about those two or, or another uh, kind of tool that might uh, help the, the listeners kind of get a, a, a glimpse of what it is that you're trying to do with these tools? Yeah, absolutely. I, those are some of my favorites too. Infinite Game actually is a reframing tool and it's because it kind of encourages the reader to start thinking about the rules and the roles and the purpose and, and the boundaries of the game of life they're playing. And it, and the idea comes from a New York NYU professor who's now passed on, but a brilliant person and thinker because he basically said, let's, let's face it. Some people play the game of life as a finite player. They're here to win. They're here to be the best. And so they go about everything in a very tactical, you know, certain fixed way because they know they've got to like be efficient and, and, and the goal is to win. And he said, whereas infinite players are here to keep the game in play. They and love the, the game. For the joy of playing. Yeah, the for game. the joy of playing. And so, you know, winning is not even an issue because that would be the game over. So it's like, they question how to do it, like their role in doing it, who they're doing that with. And all of a sudden, it just is expanded into a totally different game, right? And so what he says is uncertainty for finite players is horrible because uncertainty <laughs> comes along and all of a sudden you don't know what to do with it. And that's ruining the chances that you're going to win. Yeah. Whereas for infinite players, uncertainty is a surprise and an exciting thing because it's like, cool, what should we do with this now? So it's not really getting in the way. It's just another um, ingredient. I, I was just thinking of a fun example that we did write about in the book of an infinite player. And that is Buckminster Fuller, who's known as like, yeah, yeah, he's known as this like great futurist and thought leader and has all these patents. But I don't know what, if everybody knows about this very famous person, is that he got kicked out of university several times. He founded a company, lost uh, his position in that company. He was married at the time, living in Chicago. His first had passed away uh, from an illness, which he blamed on this drafty house because he couldn't provide a good enough house for his family. And his wife was pregnant with their second. And he was deeply depressed and 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 couldn't find a job and felt he had no prospects and, it, and would walk around the city basically getting drunk in the day. And at one point asked himself, maybe I should drown myself in the lake so at least my family could get the insurance money. And he describes this moment where he, he kind of breaks into that infinite mindset. 
almost in religious terms, because he says, I, it was this moment where I asked myself, what, what if I turn my life into a grand experiment mm. to see what one person without any money, connections, or success could do that maybe the big companies and all the organizations couldn't do? And, and, and then he went forward and he viewed life as a total experiment to do all those things. And, and sometimes he went astray. If he started to get too full of himself or too assured he thought he was right, he, he, could, he started to see it. And it showed up in, 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 as failure. And when he really did that experiment, he, he went on, as I said, to you know do all these patents and, and think, get people to think differently about everything in life. And, and even at the very end of his life, he described himself as guinea pig bee, uh, just a <laughs> grand experiment in what that one person could do. And, and I, I just, that is an example at a grand scale of being an infinite player, but we can do that at a small scale. And uh, you know, we've done that with our kids. You know, we've struggled with certain issues with our kids. And I remember this moment with one of ours presented a really hard issue and it was so strange, but, and obvious in retrospect, but I just had this moment <laughs> where I said, what if my job isn't to like, constrain this kid. What if my job is really to just say, I love you so much and I'm here to support you on that journey to figure out what's good for you. And you may make mistakes or not. And that's part of the journey. And like that, like opened up so much of our relationship just by challenging what's my role really maybe it's not what i think it is yeah i i love where you guys are going with this and it it really resonates i think in this idea that if we view the world and view our life in it as this constant element that is either an experiment or a game or some other thing that we we don't win or lose at it it is just part of what happens and we can either take that with curiosity and joy and some fascination around it and go all right this is great now what do i do right as opposed to trying to control and 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 make that and nathan i love the the bringing it down to our family because we can think about that for us but it is also very much in how we relate with others and particularly children in my in, in my belief, because I don't know, at least with my kids, I'm always it's like, oh, I have to make sure that they're doing X and Y in order to get Z at the end, because I want them to have a good life. And that's the only way to do it. And I don't know that they don't know that. But yet we assume that wow, if I don't make sure that they get to this school and do these types of activities and do X and Y, that then, the, you know, I, I have failed for some reason. And that's not necessarily what it is. And so just you talking about that made me go, I can use this this concept, this tool, not just for me, but also for, well, for me, but for me in working with others. And I think that's a really important insight. So, yeah. You know, I, I just have to add to that, you know, Steve Jobs, when he was alive, used to say, you know, it's all made up. <laughs> all these rules and prescriptions are, are made up by other humans. And when you realize that, it's incredibly liberating. But I, but to add to that, I was just thinking about this yesterday because I had read about this study where they found this stone axe workshop that they now date as 1.2 million years old, which pushes back the previous deadline, <laughs> half a million years. And this is like evidence of specialized labor. This isn't just somebody tinkering around. This is like an organized, specialized labor, Adam Smith style. And if you think about it, if you calculate how many generations have happened of human beings from that time to now, it's probably 50,000 to 60,000. You have 60,000 grandmas going that far back. Like, I, I don't even know how we can conceive of how big that is. And, and that maybe all these rules we hold ourselves down to, really, maybe they can be pushed. Maybe they can be challenged because, you know, our piece, unfortunately, is a little piece. <laughs> so like, let's make it an amazing piece if it we is, need to. It is an infinite game that goes beyond our own our own lives. And and you talk about grandmothers and you, uh, one of the, the quotes in your book is from uh, your grandmother, right? Parents teach their children to live their dreams by living their own dreams. And that, it, again, resonated so much with me because, again, 
we we can tell our kids as much as we want, right? And uh, m- many times that goes in one ear and out the other ear. But what they really notice is is how we are behaving and how we are living our life. So I just, I, again, I, I yeah. love that quote. Yeah, You know, that is actually a perfect segue into that other piece that you talked about, which was the possibility quotient. Yeah. Because I think this infinite game discussion and that grandmother wisdom really are about this idea that if we are holding back and we are trying to make our world so small and certain, we won't have the potential for for possibility, really. We can actually structure our lives so small and so tight and rigid. Dumb uncertainties will keep happening to us, but like the ones that we would go after won't because we'll be too scared of them, right? And so the possibility quotient, we wanted to create a mathematical equation, actually, because we thought it would be so cool. We were like doing little, you know, lowercase letters and stuff. But the idea was... You know, if you are willing to get on frontiers, which is another one of our tools. So just stepping out towards an unknown for you it could be on any matter of, you know, geography or relationship. All of these places where we might think, oh, yeah, that's that's known and I'm good with it. If we can take a little bit of a step out, our possibility quotient. So the likelihood that something new happens there goes up. But the more we streamline and 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 with our kids, we can hold our kids back and create low possibility quotients for them. If we're always only saying, you know, I've noticed they're really good at this, so I'm only going to have them do this. And when they're struggling, I want to keep them away from that. You know, and that's why we have this snowflake generation is kids need to also be able to go out on frontiers and experience things and, and, and experience setbacks because that is a human thing. So, you know, I and I. That quote you brought up is why we live in France. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. I think it's it's illustrative because so we had visited France before as a visiting professor thing. We got really lucky. And that is a series of adjacent possibles. Yep. But yeah, that's an incredibly fortunate opportunity. I just want to acknowledge that. But what we didn't expect is that we would fall in love with it. But but we didn't have a way to stay. And and so what happened is uh, later, many years later, we got offered a job. And the job was at this university, which is one of the top schools in my field. And it's in this place that we kind of dream about. And, but, but that may sound like, oh, that's so obvious, but, but take a minute and put yourselves in what is probably a very familiar decision framework. That is, we're living at, 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 we're in the U S at a very good university. We like our colleagues. Susanna's family lives up the street. Our kids are in school. The oldest is in (laughs) high school. So like, you don't want to disrupt them and, and everything's very comfortable. And we get this offer and I'm like, ah, it sounds so good, but how could I disrupt the routine? And, and then I called my grandmother and she, that's when she gave me that advice. You know, oh parents gosh. teach their children to live their dreams when the parents live their dreams. And at that moment I knew, oh my gosh, I have to do this. But you know, we didn't realize it then, but we were also employing some of the other tools we use in the book, which is. Let, we talked about experiment, turning life into experiment. We turn that decision into an experiment. You could look at that decision as we're going forever. And that's a hard decision to make. Yeah. If you were going for one year, yeah, come on. Who, who wouldn't try a dream for one year? And then, you know, maybe the next year is an experiment. And the next year. And then, you know, seven years later, you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's foreshadowing anything that happened in your life or, or retrospecting on that, I guess. Yeah. All right. So we could probably go on that uh, long. Let's go back to the Swiss first aid cross. Yeah, the Swiss cross, first aid cross. We have prime, we have do, we have sustain. Tell us a little bit more about one of those. Let's kind of get get all four and, and we don't maybe not have to go into as deep as we did with with uh, reframing. But let's what are some of the tools around some of those other areas? So I think a really important one in Prime, we have two that we like to share, but maybe the most important to be able to get this better possibility quotient is the idea that uncertainty is super stressful and how can you go into it with a little more courage? You can add what we call uncertainty balancers. So we gave it that name because when we were doing this research and talking to these people who seemed so bold and never afraid and just really like courageous... And you ask them about it and they're like, yes, I love uncertainty so much. And even I have said that before. But when you dig a little bit further on the backstage, they they revealed that they actually have some rituals, some comfort, some things that they really count on 
that creates this oasis of certainty so that they can do these kind of intense, uncertain lives and, and startups or whatever the thing is they're doing. So for an example, one woman said, I eat uncertainty for breakfast, meaning <laughs> she loves it so much. It's like her breakfast of choice. But she actually later said, admitted, well, I actually carry my my breakfast with me every day. It's the same granola that I love. I, I need to know that, I, that I'm going to have that. We're like, whoa, <laughs> that's huge, right? And, you know, so that would be a ritual or something that you count on. And it can be outfits, wardrobe choice. Obama always had just navy or gray suits. And then he could pick easily, you know, the tie to go with and he's done. So those kind of decisions are really about giving room, giving energy for things that matter more than just like every day having to decide, oh my gosh, what am I going to wear in an hour later? You're like yeah. mad and like a heap of yeah. clothes, you know, those people don't deal with that. Right. Yeah. Well, as Obama, when he did wear the one tan suit and it caused all the, the, the ruckus that that was going on at that point. <laughs> yeah. So like maybe that even reinforced that element within there. It probably I, did. I love that. And, it, and I, I don't know if this is in line with what you're talking about, but, you know, in finance and in kind of people who are doing investing, right? They might take some really big risks, but they might also hedge and have some kind of elements of hedging that, all right, this could blow up, but at least I have this safety net in the background. And is that part of what these uncertainty balancers are or are they or are they more more psychological from that as opposed to kind of realistic or how, how would love, you describe that? You know what you did? You actually just added another prime tool, which would be the personal real options yeah. tool. Okay. So because that is that is where you do if you're you know, it's like it's like investors. They have and they they have some of their funding or whatever investment in something that's more solid and certain that they know isn't gonna go anywhere. So in a in a life that could be say you're doing a career but you really want to do this other idea. Don't quit the job. And to go all in on the other thing, because you might actually kind of end up bombing that other option by just being <laughs> too stressed financially. So personal real options is is another prime tool, though, because it does give you some certainty so that you can kind of foray into these other realms that are curious to you, but not certain. And it very broadly applies. Actually, it was the gentleman who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, Ben Feringa, who really talked about this in a way that kind of crystallized it for us, because he talked about like he, he literally said science is all uncertainty mm -hmm. and to create this breakthrough, he had to get really good at himself and his students stepping into the unknown. And I asked him, so how do you teach your students to do that? And he said exactly what you just said. He said, I, I want them to have, you don't want to have just the uncertain thing because he said, you will actually chase that too far down a path when it might not be the right thing. But instead to have a certain option and an uncertain option and to get certainty out of that portfolio of options. And the thing for me, though, that I always take away from this idea, you know, Susanna hit the main thrust, which is you should do it at the same time. In fact, research shows that hybrid entrepreneurs are more successful than those who quit their jobs because they have the time to figure it out and get it right before they kind of go all in and they have to make the rent payments and whatever it may be. But, but for me, the big warning I want to make sure I, I leave with folks is that the real danger for most of us is not that we're getting distracted from our job because we're doing something on the side or that we're going all in on some risky thing. The real danger for most of us is that we're all in on the certain thing, uh -huh. the, the job that maybe isn't inspiring us and we're not doing the option on the thing that inspires us, that, that we care about, that matters to us. And so that that would be my my hope and wish for folks is that they they do take that personal real option on the thing that they care about. Fantastic. Can we go back to uncertainty balancers really quick? Because just to kind of give an example of how it's different, someone that's doing that option where they have the safe and and the a little foray into the unknown, those are still they're still going to need some uncertainty balancers. So Maybe psychological, but it can be a physical thing. It might be, you know, one company said we always have a stand up meeting where we say what worked and what didn't work on Friday afternoons, and then we all go get a drink. So it yeah. can be a comforting physical actual thing you do. It can be a workout, it can be people, but uncertainty balancers are really comforting, cozy rituals or, or streamlining decisions that help you have calm. Because, you know, our main point is don't try to take on all uncertainty at once and don't try to think actually that it's ever going to become like this doesn't this doesn't <laughs> affect me at all because oh. you got to embrace being human. 
but give yourself some cozy stuff to be able to do it. Fantastic. Let's move on to do what what uh, one or two kind of tools around the do side of that uh, safety cross. Do is a fun one for me because there's actually quite a bit of research in my field of innovation and entrepreneurship about how to do. And, uh, you know, the biggest things I think might be intuitive to people, which is, for example, it's so much better to take something uncertain and break that down into a series of small experiments rather than plan and execute, you know, as a big Mm -hmm. action. Um, So, for example, if you have an idea or a project, rather than spending, you know, forever planning it and then quitting your job and then executing on that plan, instead say, what could I do this this week or this month as a little piece and a little experiment to do that? And and maybe to build on that, one of the things I think is kind of counterintuitive, uh, but that is revealing from the research is a, a really puzzling question when you want to do something new, whatever it may be. Let's say you want to start a new venture or a new project. It can there, There's so many pieces to it, if you think about it. Like a new venture, there's like, what am I going to make? And how am I going to sell it? And who am I going to sell it to? And in what geography? And who are my... There's so much to pay attention to. And it can feel like, should I do everything at once? Or should I focus on one thing at a time? It's kind of one of those puzzles. And when yeah. if you go out and you read the media, you, you'll hear these stories about these rocket ship companies and they did hired this and did all this and and everything was amazing all at once. But actually in a comparative case study of similar startups pursuing similar opportunities, what they found is it's much better to focus on one thing at a time. The most important thing to, to, to give yourself the time to learn and engage with that and to get that most important thing to a point that's good enough maybe Mm -hmm. not perfect, and then rotate to the next most important thing, and then the next most important thing. And I think a good analogy to help this make sense is it's like how a great chef would prepare a meal. Mm. A great chef would not try to have all the pans on the front burner, everything going at once, because it's too much. You can't really do anything well. Nor would the great chef say, let me cook the chicken to absolute perfection, let it go cold, and then I'll cook the carrots. No. What that chef does is they rotate those pots from front burner to back burner. And the reason why I like that research so much is I think it helps make it easier for whatever it is you're doing to to take some comfort in it's okay to do a small step and it's okay to do it in one area. I don't have to do it all at once, either all the activities or the whole journey all at once. That's how things actually happen well. And and so if we think about that with, uh, you could say that could apply to a project, but we were talking about children. That can apply to a child. I sometimes want to sit down and have the great and glorious speech that would be in you know (laughs) Dead Poet Society or something. And and it's all changes, but that's not really how it works with people either. It's like a a bunch of little steps. And and what can I do now, uh, today, this week, and and then next week? Mm -hmm. And it's the small steps up the mountain that really win, that we rarely celebrate that fact, but that is really how we do and take action on uncertainty. Yeah, we we all want to be that teacher that inspires kids to stand up on their desks and do that. But that is not necessarily that wouldn't have happened, actually, if you if uh, in in that dead poet society, if they wouldn't have had that uh, small steps throughout the year as they were going, they would not have done that except for those little pieces that are coming into it. Exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, it reminds me too. So uh, we do a lot of work on, on motivation and goals and various different pieces. And many, many times organizations will put goals out for salespeople or different pieces and they're quarterly or they're annual and people get them. And the very first thing that happens is, oh my gosh, I can't, there's no way that I can achieve that. It's just way, it's, the, the goal is too far out of the possibility. And what we, we know is that if we can work with them to break those goals down into monthly goals and now into weekly goals and into daily goals, and now what do I have to do with this prospect? And all of a sudden, that big, huge, daunting goal doesn't feel so daunting anymore. And actually it feels pretty, oh, you mean I only have to talk to one extra person, you know, a week? That's it? Oh, well, wow. Then I can do that. Every, you know, I can find the time in that. And it seems very much like 
that doing part. Another piece, at least for motivation, one of the things that we know is that people have a hard time starting, right? And so the start in any kind of project or goal is often the hardest part. And it sounds like the do is sometimes just getting people to start and to embrace some of this uncertainty. Is that is that a fair statement? Absolutely. In fact, one of the tools we talk about is uh, something well known in the field of innovation, which we call bricolage, which yeah. is this idea of just making do and, and that actually most innovation, the best innovation happens that way. So we can have this tendency to say, well, I got to wait until all these pieces are in place. But bricolage says you take what you have at hand, you make do, and sometimes that's even better and often it's better than kind of getting everything in place. And, and you know, there's so many examples of this, but maybe one inspiring one is uh, called Reconstructed Living Labs. It's in South Africa in the Cape okay. Flats area called Our Labs. And it's one of the rare uh, social uh, enterprises that has scaled and gone, you know, many other places and countries. And it all started from bricolage and scaled because of bricolage. So specifically... Cape Flats area has, you know, over 50% unemployment, less than 25% of people have a high school education. It is a place that people who live there describe as despairing and without hope. And what this uh, Marlon Parker did is he said, well, what do we have a lot of? We have a lot of time because nobody has a job. We have a lot of space because there are these abandoned buildings. He, he found a computer that was in the attic of, of you, know, you know, local business. And he said, well, let's teach each other the things we know. And let's just give the, each other hope, really. And so with essentially nothing, just saying, what do we have a lot of? He started building it and people started teaching each other. And then somebody would get a job and that would give somebody hope. And and, and, and they've gone on to nurture many, many projects for, you know, especially for youth, but then to do that in many other countries. And every time they open up a new R Labs and they have a list of, we need these 10 things. The first question is, do you really need it? Could you borrow yeah. it? Could you, you know, could you, does a friend have it? You know, could you do without? And, and it's that getting started with what you have and making do. And, and that's not just an inspiring story. I just want you to know there's, research that supports this. So in my field, the race to create the first wind turbines, the wind uh, renewable energy industry between the Danes and the US, the Danes won, friends, because they did bricolage. They would just slap stuff together. They'd use gears from old trucks, even sometimes wooden blades. Whereas in the US, we're like, we trust in our science. We're going to make a big breakthrough. But every time we made a breakthrough, the Danes were already there or ahead of us. Yeah. And, and so I just want to say, this is not just feel good stuff that we're talking about. This is stuff backed up by both anecdotes and wherever possible, empirical evidence that, that this is how stuff happens. All right. We have a little bit of time left, so let's talk sustain, and then I will be berated uh, mercilessly if, if I didn't ask a music question at the end. So let's talk sustain here real quick, and then for Tim, I will ask a music question. So the sustain tools are, this is not meant to be confusing, but helpful. We broke those down again into three little categories because... We find that when when you need the sustain toolkit, you're probably in a little bit of distress. And so there are three categories of things you should give yourself. One is emotional hygiene. And we use that kind of borrowing um, from Guy Winch, who is an NYU professor and I think psychiatrist also, but he shares this idea that we've had physical hygiene. It actually increased our life expectancy, but it was relatively new at turn of the century. And we are so bad at emotional hygiene. Because we make things worse. When bad things happen to us, we make it about our fault. He actually likens it to like, if we had an owie, you know, if a kid had a wound, they know to get a Band-Aid, no one goes and gets a knife and starts cutting their arm. But <laughs> we do that with our emotions. When things go wrong, we say, oh, I'm so hideous or I'm so dumb or, you know, it's it woe is me kind of stuff. So emotional hygiene is really about letting yourself off the hook and like, you did your best, you know, talking positively to ourselves. The next category in sustain is reality check. And that category of tools are activities where we actually break down the situation. We actually, like an example would be worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. We actually encourage this, this thing that sometimes is a bad adjacent possible because it's hovering, but we never really look at it. And we say, take a walk down your worst case scenario and, and really get in, you know, conversation with it. What are you telling yourself about it? Would it really be that bad? 
we did this during the pandemic when it was, everything Nathan's, all his work got deleted. Um, in a year, his calendar was empty and he was really stressed about, you know, he's right now a single income in our family. I'm kind of doing some entrepreneurial things. But we looked at the worst case scenario and kind of made friends with it. We actually yeah. could see how there were benefits to a simpler life. Yeah, we'd lose some things. We'd actually not be able to pay those tuitions for our kids. But we were able to be less stressed by it because we did the reality check, which was take a really hard look at what the situation is. And then the final category we call for fun, magic, magic tools. But we mean <laughs> by this the leaps of insight or the moments of serendipity that happened that changed the course of of the uncertainty that is that was feeling like all was doomed and and the, our idea with that set of tools is to give you hope but also to remember that like a sail on a sailboat you've got to keep you know hoisting your sail and putting yourself in places where these kinds of magical things happen so it mm. might be reading a great piece of literature or turning off instagram for a minute and having a really meaningful conversation with someone and magic in that way so uh -huh. what category do you want a tool from? And we'll do a quick one. Oh Emotional my gosh. hygiene, reality check, or magic? You know, I would love to go to magic, but I'm going to go with the emotional hygiene because I think that's the one that, again, as you describe the the pairing off the or putting a Band-Aid on versus yeah. cutting with a knife, I think it it is so prevalent in the society today that I think any tool that we can get to help that doesn't have to deal with uncertainty at all. I mean, this is just in general. So yeah. let's go down there. You know, the first one we share is this idea of riding the waves, kind okay. of like a surfer or, you know, or like a woman in labor. This There is a reality that with anything good, there is there is a peak, you know, period. And then there are lows, there are valleys. And with anything we're trying to do, it's never going to be a perfect, just easy ride up. And so... You know, this is also something that's been studied a lot. You know, they talk about it with expat communities where you get to France and you're like, oh, my gosh, there's the Eiffel Tower and this baguette is so delicious. And oh, my gosh, did you see that guy with the beret? And you think everything's great. And then two months in, your kids hate school. It's gray all the time. It's so hard to pay for school lunches. I have to wait in four hour lines. The pharmacy is like not doing, you know, every month you have to bring your prescription again instead of them keeping it in the computer. So you have this tattered piece of paper, like really annoying stuff. And being able, riding the waves is about saying, whoa, this is really hard. You know what? I think I'm in one of those valleys. Gosh, have I felt like this before? So you kind of think back like, yeah, or it might be, oh my gosh, it's January. It's February. It's so great. I need vitamin D. But you kind of see where you're at. You observe it and you think, you know what? This might turn. It might even turn tomorrow. And you start kind of getting used to these waves. And when you're on a high, you notice, and it's kind of Buddhist because you're like, you're trying not to attach to either thing and knowing this is the, this is life. These are these waves and it's not, I'm not doing anything wrong. This is perfectly normal. And, you know, getting help when you need it. Some of those peaks are great and you're feeling great. And some of those valleys though, they're brutal and you might need a life coach. You might need even to take a little medication for a while. Yeah. Thank you, Susanna. That was fantastic. All right. Before we get to the music question, we we di we did our first interview. God, it was what seven eight months ago, and the book was relatively new then. It's been out now for a while, so I have to ask you, what is new? What what new stuff are you guys working on? I know before we got on air, we started talking a little bit about uh, some virtual uh, elements that you're working on and kind of some different pieces. So we want to share a little bit about that. Yeah, it's so funny. We get so excited about the ideas. I, I forgot to even mention the book. I mean, it's the upside <laughs> of uncertainty. That's what it's called. And 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 that was because we all know the downsides of uncertainty. What we are trying to do is help people see the upside uh, and to recognize that it could be there even in hard situations. So, you know, even with Tim, which we hope all the best for him, but you know, when you see Tim again, you will see him with more appreciation than, than you did before being aware that, you know, life is precious and short. And, and so we wanted to make that more available to people. So we created an asynchronous virtual course, uh, on the website, the upside of uncertainty.com, which is and, and it's, you know, us talking through each of the tools, but we're also working on putting a front end on that that says, for whatever challenge or opportunity you face, like, I lost my job, what do I do? Or I, I have to make this hard decision. What tools might give you some points of reflection to face that better? So so we just, we try to make that available to folks as, as you know, as easily as possible. But, but we're also seeing it now as part of a 
greater effort, which we're calling the up school. And up, of course, upside, but also really it came from uncertainty, possibility of being two sides of the same coin. Uh-huh. Where we're, we're doing other projects, like how do people define meaningful work that is robust and Im- and even impervious to some of the the discouragements that, that, that characterize our world of ups and downs. And we call that the earnest project about people who do work for the sake of doing it really well. And so we see that as like an ongoing conversation. There's a community there. And we just want people to be aware of it because it'll be a more interesting conversation if people are sharing like what they have faced and what they learned and what tools, because we don't, we didn't put the final nail in the coffin or something here. We, we started a conversation. So we just really want to have that conversation with folks at the upside of uncertainty.com. That is just so wonderful because again, one of the things that you're talking about is, is is taking this to a bigger picture and bringing it to more people in more different ways that they can actually use this to help improve their lives uh, in, in ways that, again, we don't even know, right? Because it is that uncertainty of what could happen and the possibilities that that result from that. So that is fantastic. Okay, we are at that time where Tim would typically have a much more insightful question, probably something about your Max Richter and Vivaldi, but I will just ask the simple question, what's on your playlist these days? What are you guys listening to? And do you listen to the same things as a couple or do you each have your own individual playlist that you guys like put your headphones on and like just jam out to yourself? So I have to say this ties into the book. I'll tell you why. Yeah. So one of the ideas in reframing is this, Susanna mentioned it, frontier, seeing the frontier, the boundary between what you know and don't know, not as a scary place, but as like the place where, where you'll do your best work. And um, how that how does that manifest in your everyday life? It, it's that you choose the same restaurants, you choose the same activities, you, you a, a new crazy dangerous role is offered and you say, I'm going to play it safe where I am. What innovators do is they frame that as the place they'll do their best work. So let me give you a real example. I had been traveling overseas. I get back jet lagged. Yeah. It's Saturday morning and I haven't slept well on the flight. I'm tired. And we get invited by a friend to attend this ballet by the English National Ballet, a very familiar old narrative ballet called Giselle. It's, you know, well known. You know, I wouldn't say like ballet is intuitively the first thing I want to do when I'm jet lagged, you know, and, and you know, so, so uh, we, we, so, but, but I remember this tool of frontier and, you know, of course it doesn't always turn out great, but we go to this ballet and it turns out it's been reimagined by Akram Khan, who is from Bangladesh, but brings in the styles of dance from Northern India to reimagine this old European ballet. And, and he sets it in the setting of a abandoned textile factory and the migrant workers who are left behind. And the music, which was originally by Adolf Adam, is reimagined today by Vincenzo La Magna, who takes this ominous Gothic score and then brings in these like discordant modern elements. And I'm telling you, Stepping onto that frontier, I came away totally transformed. I walked away from that performance just blown away, just the purpose of my life, like just asking that question and re-seeing it and rethinking it. And all of it after being jet lagged, I mean, I was just so shocked. And so, so we do listen to some of the same things, some of the different things. I'll be quiet and let Susanna answer, but I just... I just highlight, I just, when you ask that question, I just think there's such power in these things to help us re-see ourselves if we try. Well, it's true. We have a lot of friends. I remember when we were newlyweds and they kept, they were listening to music from high school, which probably was only like seven years ago. But to us, we were like, (laughs) okay, that's cool. But like, we've always been, you know, in fact, last night we had a conversation with friends. We're like, we listen to the same music as our kids. My kids love to say, mom, what are you listening to right now? And sometimes it's embarrassing. (laughs) Because <laughs> last weekend it was, it was the weekend his creeping song I think, and yeah. I was like, I can groove to some of these things that like I'm like they're like just don't listen to the lyrics, mom, you know. But um, <laughs> no, I love I love so many genres, and we our genres do overlap sometimes. But you know, I love Nathan listens to a ton of classical. I listen to a little, but I think yeah, we didn't give you an exact answer, but music for sure is a place that if we don't just let ourselves go in and and listen to new things. We're holding ourselves back from having some of these experiences that are exciting. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about you know your friends and they're listening to the music from high school. There's been research, and I only know this because Tim is really into this, but there's research that the vast majority of the, the music that we tend to fall back to, that we listen to most, comes from our formative years. And whether that be like pre-teen to teenage years to maybe uh, maybe a little later into your 20s, and, but it's in that range. And that's typically the fallback that we we tend to have. And as you said, Susanna, the, this idea of like, I, I did that. That was my fallback until my kids. And then, you know, you're in the car and I used to go, well, I'm driving. I get to choose what's on the radio. And then you realize that's not really the best thing because you get some really upset kids. And so all of a sudden you're listening to other music that you wouldn't normally listen to. And I'm going, oh, this is actually pretty good. This is, you know, I kind of got it. So you're introduced to some of these new musics that you wouldn't necessarily be introduced to because you're putting yourself into those positions. And so I, I love that as, as we're going forward. So Nathan and Susanna, thank you. Thank you for sticking with us and to coming back and to doing this uh, again and again and again. It was fantastic. And I'm really sorry that Tim missed out on this because I'm sure he would have loved it, but I'm sure he'll listen and we will groove on this. And thank you so much. It was our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you guys so much and all our best to Tim. Fantastic. Welcome to the Grooving Session, where I share ideas on what I learned from my discussion with Nathan and Susanna, have a free-flowing conversation with myself, and talk about whatever comes into my uncertain brain. And uncertain is really what this is about right now. Um... I have never done a solo groove session before. Not even sure if it's possible to do a groove session without Tim. This is uh, an experiment in the unknown, and thus there is a lot of uncertainty to go with this. But here's what I take from the conversation that I had with Nathan and Susanna, is that uncertainty is too often viewed negatively, that it has a bum rap that there is a element of it that is scary. And I understand that because I'm feeling a little bit scared right now. But if we take a different perspective, if we reframe how we think about it, and if we build up some practice around being okay and comfortable in uncertain situations, it doesn't have to have that negative impact that it seems to have for most people. And what Nathan and Susanna identify is the key tenant uh, of this, at least the key tenant that I took from that conversation, is that we really need to shift our mindsets on this. That the the expectations that we have, the the world that we built up in our brains about uncertainty, the tales we've been told in our past influence how uncertainty impacts us and that the stress that we feel from the uncertainty, the dread, the fear, all of those things are built up or expanded upon because of the way that we think about it. And if we reframe how we think about it, then we can actually use uncertainty as a way to positively push us, to to open up the possibilities, to bring new energy into our lives. And I think that is really an interesting perspective on this and one that I'm embracing and one that I think if we all go out there and take a moment to think about how we think about uncertainty, and this isn't to say that we are going to take uh, undue risks, that we are going to go, oh, I'm going to jump off this cliff. I know it's the uncertainty. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I, what I'm saying is that we need to think about uncertainty. And what I think Nathan and Susanna are saying is that there is a upside to the aspect of uncertainty. And that upside can really help us look at um, our lives differently to take and, you know, explore new areas to maybe push beyond what we would normally do because we were uncertain of the outcome. And I think that this framing of uncertainty is positive and looking at it as to where growth happens in our lives, even even when the outcome 
isn't necessarily positive. There is a learning, there's a growth opportunity there. So this idea that, yeah, I can go and I can drink a new drink and I may not like it, but that's okay because that's one more piece in uh, my knowledge set. I used to do a lot of team building programs. And one of the team building exercises I did was called this electronic maze. And basically you imagine a carpet that's rolled out that looks like a six by nine checkerboard. It has different squares on it. And some of those squares, when you stepped on them, beeped. Some of them did not beep. And the idea was to, uh, was to find the path through that was an unbeeping. You had to kind of go to an adjacent square and all these different things. And what was really interesting is that, you know, when you go out there, it's uncertain. You don't know if the square, at least in a, in the time where you are going and it's a new square that you're stepping on, you don't know if that square is going to beep or not. And people would get really nervous about stepping on those squares, that there was this idea when in fact, if you think about it, there's six by nine. So what is that? 54 squares on that carpet. And what you're doing is you step on a square and it beeps. Well, that's just more information for you. Yeah, it feels like you're you're not achieving the goal, but you are because what you're actually doing is you're finding out more information. So now I know or I should know that next time I don't want to step on that square because it beeps. And so now I have one more piece of information. And that's a way of thinking about uncertainty when we think about this. And the fact of the matter is, is when I did this with teams, you know, at the beginning, they would step on the squares and it was fine because there wasn't much of a of a cost to it. In other words, um, part of the rules of this was you had to retreat your exact path back off of the, the maze, off that carpet. And if you made a mistake, then that was where the penalties were incurred. And so the further people got, and then they get to a spot where they're further down that carpet and all of a sudden it's still uncertain, there's more of a cost on the way back. They could, you know, run into an issue, they could misstep, they could have a penalty assessed. And so people became much more cautious and unwilling to take that next step in that process of doing it, when in fact, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. You already know the path back. Yeah, you might mess up, but you know that path back. You don't know the path forward. And so to be um, forward going with some bravado and thinking about this as finding the next piece of the puzzle, that's a, a different way of thinking about it. And I think that is really one of the things that I kind of took from this conversation. Now, knowing that, I understand that shifting our mindsets is difficult. Our brains crave certainty. It's safer that way, right? That even if we think about the maze that I just talked about, that carpet out there, if I step on a non-beeping square, there's no possibility of me having to go backwards and, and get a penalty. So it's safer that way. But it also means that we're not going to kind of learn anything new. And we also know that as humans, we're novelty seeking. We've talked about that a lot of times. Tim and I have talked a lot about that on this show, that we are novelty seeking. However, if we actually think about that novelty seeking, oftentimes that novelty is, I'm not going to have the same, you know, meal that I typically get at McDonald's. I will pick a number two as opposed to a number one or whatever that is, that the novelty is more about breaking the pattern or the habit. Um, and it's going to something that is not necessarily uncertain. It's just different. But there is another part of that novelty seeking, which is, no, we want to find out new things. We want to push ourselves. We want to go beyond where we currently are. Many of us at least have that, that desire. And I think that is really one of the evolutionary pushes that we have too, right? It's to push to the edge, to seek out new things. And I think one way to think about this, obviously, there's a bunch of great um, tools that Nathan and Susanna talked about in the show, but also in their book, really highly recommend the book, go out there, get that. But one of the things that this, and it always comes back to Annie Duke, right? So I'm coming back to Annie Duke and her idea about thinking in bets. And one of the ways that at least and I was kind of processing this whole thing is that uncertainty, when you think about it, is what Annie is talking about all the time, because there's always that element of luck or chance that happens. And so when we make decisions, 
we should be thinking about the probability of this. And with that probability, there always is some uncertainty as to what the outcome is going to be. There's usually very few things where we know it's 100% certain. It's always like it could be 99 or it could be 80, it could be 50%, it could be 30% likely to happen. There's an uncertainty in what we do in our decisions and kind of life in general. And if we start thinking about things and probabilities, then what that does is that that uncertainty becomes less of this feared unknown, but it's part of our everyday process. And so I think that when we can shift our thinking into probabilistic thinking, then the uncertainty kind of unfolds in a more positive light and we become accustomed to it. And it's just part of life. Life is never 100% certain. So that's what we do. And the last thing I want to talk about here is I just, I want to reiterate, I loved the um, lessons that uh, Nathan got from his grandparents, right? This idea that parents teach their children to live their dreams by living their own dreams. And I, I just encourage every parent that's out there to think about this because I, it, in, I see this way too often that people uh, try to live their lives and make their kids' lives happy and do everything for their kids. But uh, there's lots of research about resilience and, uh, you know, the way that people and kids, you know, ascribe their life. And it's not necessarily about making their lives easier or even not having any kind of negative consequences. This idea that, hey, my kid is in high school. I can't pull them out of their high school. Well, lots of people get pulled out of their high school and kids, kids actually deal with that really well. And what you're teaching them is that, hey, we are all people. And as part of who we are and part of the idea of showing them how to live a more fulfilling life, that you need to kind of live your own dreams. And that's not to say to do that without kind of thinking about the consequences and you can't be narcissistic about this and it's not always all about you, but there needs to be a give and take. And I think that's really important as we as we move forward. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up. Normally, uh, Tim would probably wrap this up a lot sooner. And so I apologize, I apologize because I am not doing the credit that uh, this deserves. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation and I really do enjoy the, the insights that I got from it. And so I implore you to th rethink your ideas on uncertainty. Go out and push your comfort zone here. Just a bit, just a bit. You don't have to, you know, go bungee jumping or skydiving or anything, but do something that you might have been a little bit more hesitant about and rethink about the way that you're thinking about it so that it brings a, opens up the possibilities as opposed to bring stress and fear. And this week, go out to the unknown world and go find your group there.